welcome back to room 237 and I have another horror movie review and um, this time I'm doing actually kind of a newer film it came out last year in 2020 um, uh, I know those movies are kind of odd to talk about because of how they came out or not odd to talk about but because of corona which is still going on lots of movies got put off or delayed or had very odd unorthodox ways of releasing but this is a movie that i've wanted to see ever since i found out it came out i didn't know anything about this movie while it was being made or even before it came out it it was distributed partly through redbox entertainment i don't know if that just means they helped get it out uh, i know it was mostly streaming and i think it was playing at some drive-ins here and there throughout the summer but I think I do remember seeing it at Redbox. I also know that it was um, streaming as well, especially on iTunes. But that's the 2020 action thriller, as it's called, but Becky. Yeah, it's. I've seen it labeled on the internet as an action thriller. And even though I don't argue with genres, a, a, a film is what it is. It's a home invasion movie. It has all the hallmarks of a home invasion movie. Everything from The Strangers to Panic Room to You're Next. The only real action-y thing about it is it's a bit more like Home Alone. We do have a young kid sort of fighting back, but in very bloody ways. Now, it was... <clears throat> excuse me. It was... Written and directed, it had dual directors, uh, J Jonathan Millot, Jonathan Millet, Millot, probably mispronounced that, and Carrie Murnian had several producers, uh, Raphael Margulis, J.D. Livschitz, Jordan Yale Levine, Jordan Yale Levine, let me say that correctly, Jordan Beckerman, and Ra Ross Posternak. <coughs> Three writers, Nick Morris, Elaine Sky, and Ruckus Sky, which they are a husband and wife team. It stars Lulu Wilson, Joel McHale, and the selling point for me, Kevin James as the main antagonist. Now, I've always liked the idea of long-time comedian comedic actors, comedians, going not just dramatic, but more in like a thriller direction. The best example I could think of would be like uh, uh, Robin Williams. May he rest in peace. Still love the guy. Always have. One of the funniest people that's ever lived. Undeniably. Robin Williams has always been great. But he didn't just do drama very well. When he did a thriller... He was scary. Even if he was sympathetic, like in One Hour Photo, you he still did it very well. Now, it doesn't always work. A lot of times, it can fall flat. Um, Jim Carrey in the number 23. I don't remember being very great. I know there was a movie that came out recently, like with Jim Gaffigan as like a dad who's been... a. I don't know if it was custody or visitation, but he's been denied and he becomes like a psycho stalker. I've been meaning to check that out. I have been meaning to check out Adam Sandler and Uncut Gems. I know that's more like a drama, but Kevin James, he, whether I'm a fan of the comedian or not, I just like seeing someone try to mix it up that much. Like I know uh, Jim from The Office is known for Jack Ryan as well, but he was great in A Quiet Place. And Kevin James, I, I can't say I'm the biggest fan of him in general. I saw uh, King of Queens as a kid. I was, you know, I, I thought it was funny. Never been b big on his movies, whether, I don't know if they've all been put out by Happy Madison or not, but, you know, not a fan of Paul Blart. Never saw The Zookeeper. Movies he did with Adam Sandler, I didn't really find funny. So I'm not really a Kevin James fan. I have seen his stand-up, so that's probably what I like him. Probably what I like of his the most. 
But I really was curious to see what this sort of Happy Madison veteran can bring to this type of role. But you also have uh, Joel McHale, who I think has done some uh, dramatic stuff, which I haven't seen. But I know he is also known as a comedic actor. And I've always seen him as like the over-the-top douche. Like, like in Ted, his show The Soup. And they both did a great job. They both actually did very well. I was really surprised with Kevin James. Sure, the script and some of his dialogue wasn't the best. But I bought him as this character, Dominic. And some things do seem cliche, like he's the skinhead prisoner that has swastikas tattooed all over him. Granted, they actually do something with it. There are aspects of this film that I really do enjoy that I don't think other people are the biggest fans of. But there really isn't much to get into plot-wise. It's a home invasion movie. Uh, oh, also... Uh, uh, Lulu Wilson, who I know has been in Annabelle Creation, uh, Ouija Origins of Evil, which are movies I haven't checked out. I saw the first. I know Annabelle Creation is known to be far superior. I'm just not interested in Annabelle or Ouija movies. He did the first ones. As good as the sequels may be, maybe at some point, but I... I liked her in this. She she was 15, but there were some parts where she did very well. Like, I could see her going like... She kind of reminded me of Chloe Grace Moretz. I mean, kind of looks like her, but I can see her doing more stuff in the future, and I would like to. <clears throat> but the story... it. It is one of those things... Oh, well, I'm not very organized. I was going to say, one of the biggest complaints is that she's a bit too bratty. I can see why people think that, and I do agree. I think it's perfectly acceptable in the beginning. But if there was some sort of arc where that changed, I think that would have been far better. It didn't really do it in that aspect, but I still think she did just fine. Now, of course, this does fall victim to one of the... Something that's become a very annoying cliche, especially in horror films, is we get an opening. It's at the very end, either the end of the ordeal or the aftermath. Kind of, she's being interrogated by a sheriff and I think like a child psychologist asking her about what happened to the man in the woods or however they worded it. And then, you know, boom to black two weeks earlier. Uh, we have to establish something, you know, jump back and work our way forward. I hate it when movies do that. Like, just tell the story. Because also, it's kind of like telling a prequel. You know what's going to happen. You know, I mean... I guess it was no question she was going to live anyway, but you, you do kind of kill a lot of suspense that way. Now, she's with her dad, played by Joel McHale. They have kind of a strained relationship because her mother died somewhere around a year prior. Um, even though it didn't really say, I think it was like cancer or leukemia. It shows her, you know, being in bed with the treatment. She's still going through the grieving. Has a very... It does feel like an angsty, rebellious teen relationship with uh, uh, Joel McHale. But also the pain of having lost her mother. They have two pit bulls, beautiful pit bulls, named uh, Diego and Dora. And he's taking her out to their family lake house, their vacation home. She was under the idea he was going to sell it after the loss of her mother. He surprised her by saying, we're not going to. But at the same time, his new girlfriend shows up with her young son. 
And of course, she's upset by that. And while that's going on, we see Kevin James and three other convicts. I think there's some sort of, there's like some sort of prison, uh, uh, why can't I think of it? Transportation, wow. They're transporting prisoners. And like every other movie where there's transporting prisoners, they escape. We see some guy with a car. They're dressed in the guard's outfits. They stop him. He kills the guy while one of his uh, helpers kills the kids. Doesn't show it, but implies it. I will say his guys are very stock. I mean, you have the ever loyal one that goes through the arc of redemption. You have the useless one and kind of the dumb one. You know, the one that gets killed right off. Uh, Robert Melee plays Apex, who is his sort of right-hand guy. He remind, he was in 300, Sherlock Holmes, Immortals, Hercules, Deadpool 2. Oh, he's he was a professional wrestler named Kurgan. He kind of looked like... Uh, the TV show version of Punisher. But eventually, they get to Becky's house. She's already got pissed, ran off to her fort, her clubhouse out in the woods. And they take the family hostage. What Kevin James is looking for is there's some sort of key that we've seen her wear around her neck. It's also in flashbacks with her mother. It has some sort of triangle design that Kevin James has tattooed on his hand. He wants the key. One thing I do like about this movie is it doesn't say what the key goes to, what they need it for, like where it is, where they have to use it, how it got there. <clears throat> he did say it was in a tin that was in the wall, then she found it. So... But it doesn't say what it goes to, and I like that. It's kind of like the Pulp Fiction briefcase. We don't need to know. It's just... It's the one motivation our characters need to be there. Why they won't leave until they have it. We don't need to know anymore. I like when movies don't spoon-feed us every aspect of a movie. Like, I know there's some people that want prequels and sequels because this one little question wasn't answered. But here, I like a little bit of ambiguity. We don't need to know what it goes to. He hints towards his partner Apex that, you know, this is everything we need. This key is everything we've worked for. And yeah, some of his lines aren't that great. They even have the over-the-top scene when he has Apex sort of show that he's still loyal he like takes his shirt off not only does he have a swastika tattooed on the back of his head and two on his back but he's got like a huge ss eagle tattoo should probably move these <clears throat> um and then how it kicks off is she has a walkie-talkie in her fort there's one in the house they choose... Oh, and this is going to have spoilers. Uh, I do recommend this. Definitely if you're a Kevin James fan, or even if you're not a Kevin James fan, if you don't like his comedies, still check this out, because he does do very well. He is more than Paul Blart. And if you like Home Invasion movie, I, I'll actually put this over your next. I know a lot of people... I'll probably disagree with that, and that's fine. I think Your Next is a little overrated. But I actually had more fun with this. <clears throat> you do kind of get some good dialogue. Like, he has his guys look throughout the house to make sure everyone's gone. They, Which, the Apex guy lets the girlfriend and son go. He doesn't want to hurt kids anymore. But they get outside. They run into the other guys. And then one of the dogs comes along. The guy shoots the dog. 
they get back and they find a backpack and a girl's cell phone and Kevin James is like is that you know that's a girl's backpack and girl's phone does that look like his like there's a girl here Joe McHale says she's in Atlanta visiting her mother and he's like but you have her backpack and her phone you're lying to me and actually there was some dialogue that I liked I don't, it's going to sound weird because of the context, but they don't just give him swastikas to, and a shaved head to be like, okay, he's the skinhead, he's the bad guy. And they don't try to emphasize that with him just saying slurs or whatever. There's a, a line of dialogue where he's pretending to be, I think he pretends to be like the neighbor when he first gets to the house so he can be invited in. And he sees the dog and he says, Cade Corso, or Corso. Joe McHale's like, yeah, he's a Corso. And he's like, mix, it's not pure. He's like, uh, yeah, he's a mix, not sure what he is. He's like, my dog is a Rottweiler. Or as the Germans call, whatever it is he says, he's like, you know, these dogs are bred for stuff, bred for certain things. And then the camera looks at Joe McHale and his girlfriend who happens to be black, and he says, you know, that's why you don't breed with other, you don't mix with other breeds. And it's just a little sort of, it adds more, it, it builds upon his character being a racist by using sort of some more original dialogue than just saying like slurs. I guess it's a little bit smarter than that, I guess. And then, you know, they start by torturing Joel McHale with a hot uh, a s'more stick. Eventually, they do kill him. And then she does cat and mouse with his guys. Like, the first guy, she's out in her fort. And he say, look, just throw the key and we'll leave. I don't care what happens to you. But she has like this little montage where she breaks a ruler and gets some colored pencils together. Goes up to the roof on a trapeze. Tosses a corner so it looks like the key. Goes down the trapeze, stabs him in the neck with the ruler. Then stabs him a bunch of times with the colored pencils. Think about the gore effects. A lot of the blood is CGI. Yeah, I would even say it's awful CGI. But you do get some good blood and like actual gore, like the actual meat and viscera is practical and done very well. You know, like the stab wounds from the ruler and the pencils, even in his face, he's all messed up. And yeah, she does have these sort of fits of rage, almost primal. Kind of get the idea she's venting the anger of the loss of her mother through these as well. Then the second guy, who's kind of useless, gets told to go after her. She sets up kind of a booby trap down on a dock where he trips on some fishing wire, lands on his knees, which there's a board with the nails up. She comes up and hits him a few times with this other board with nails, which... His reaction time is very slow. I will say that. Like, he... Like, it looks like it's taken her a while to pull the board back out and hit him again. Almost like you... It almost looks like they're acting, I guess. She knocks him in the water, and then she... I spit on your graves him with the boat. Because he can't swim. And in my head, I'm like, just stand up. Like, you're on a dock. You're probably close. To, you should probably stand up. But she backs the boat up, chews him up with the uh, engine. And yes, the blood spurting out is terrible CGI. But some of the chunks in the water do look good. So then the guy Apex finds her. Kind of roughs her up a bit because she's fighting back. And that's when he says, look, look I'm done. Tired of hurting kids. I don't want to hurt kids anymore. Don't care what Dominic wants. I'm going to walk away. And I hope you do the same. 
She doesn't. <clears throat> she goes back to the house. Just as Kevin James is about... Well, at one point, uh, I did forget to say this. That this was both done well and kind of funny. I don't know how I forgot to mention this. While he's killing Joel McHale, because he, he's leading... He's leading Joel McHale back into the house. And then she pops up. This is when they first see each other. He he shoots Joel McHale dead. She ends up stabbing him in the eye with something. So he goes in the house and his eyeball is dangling from the vein or whatever. And so he's he's like holding it. And yeah, it decent effect. And he's trying to get someone to cut it off for him. So the idiot guy that gets chewed up in the boat looks in the drawer and he gets like these little pink like kindergartner scissors, round tip scissors. And he's holding his eye and he keeps trying to cut it, but he can't. And he's like, ow, ow, ow. He's like, what is the issue? So he grabs it out of his head and he's like, you fucking kidding me? And he just grabs a, a kitchen knife, puts his head down on the cutting board and just slits it off. But then he kind of goes back to being normal, like like he's screaming, ah, ah, cuts it off. She's a little more than we bargained for. But just the whole trying to cut with the kid's scissors, and are you kidding me? I thought that was funny. So he's about to kill the girlfriend and her son. She sets off a car alarm. He goes out, opens the van, the other dog Diego attacks him he's able to fight him off then she's in the girlfriend's car I think it's the girlfriend's car she goes kind of hits or bumps him hits a tree runs off he runs around the house now she's by the fireplace where she's singing this song cooking a marshmallow he goes on to talk about the potential she has with her violence. And he's like, I just want the key. I don't want to hurt you. She takes out a squirt gun. And you can see where it's going. The fire's going. It's like, you, you get the line for, the, I don't know if it was in the trailer, but it's a trailer line. Like, oh, but I do want to hurt you really bad. Pulls the trigger, line of fire. Hits him. He burns up. Chase ensues. Eventually Apex intercepts him. They get in a fight. She gets on the four-wheeler with the lawnmower behind it. Apex pushes him out of the way and she drives right over him. And I like the angle down on the ground by like his flopping arm. We see practical chunks flying. And then when she drives off, his head is like a perfect 90 degree angle where this is all gone. And I mean, we see skull, brain, rest of skull, practical, looks good. And then Apex is sort of just sitting there kind of talking about wanted to leave, but I saved you. And then she just up and shoots him right in the head. Then she has a loud screaming fit again. I will say that was a little done over the top. And then at the end, she's sitting down. Girlfriend and her son goes and sits by her. We see cop lights. It, I do think some of the complaints about her as a character probably probably would have been as bad if there was the reaction of like maybe if she just something as small as like if she just put her head on Joel McHale's girlfriend's shoulder like to show some sort of connection because there is a back and forth between while well, her and Kevin James are by the fire before she lights him up about how you know now you're a murderer Who's going to want, like, who's going to adopt you? You're an orphan. No one's going to want to deal with that. 
But they don't. They just kind of have her sitting there. She doesn't look at her, doesn't respond. She's still sort of... She's still the person she was in the beginning. Now she's just killed a few people. But... Or maybe if they did more of a job of her making it more obvious that she is channeling her grief through these murders of the grief of her mother and now her father. Because before she kills the guy with the ruler, she's looking at this painting, this family portrait that her mother did. So I kind of get the idea that's how she's getting through all this. And then it ends again with her being asked by the sheriff if she remembers anything. And she says she remembers him looking for a Canadian quarter. But I don't remember anything else. And then he takes the, I think it's the kid psychologist outside. <clears throat> and it kind of plays off like she doesn't remember. Because we hear the psychologist say, because of the violence she's done, it's called blind spot. She doesn't remember certain things. But she's kind of twirling the key so I guess it, I guess it's no secret Kevin James was looking for this key so if she says anything about it I guess it's just the best way of her to say I don't know I don't remember killing them I don't because all these other details she says she can't remember she can't remember anything then it just ends pretty much ends with her either denying it or just having no memory because it's too traumatic. But one thing I didn't mention was the music. The closest thing I could think of would be the collection, whether during the main menu or the scenes at the rave. Like I think this scene, while she's hiding under the window and he's looking for her, great, almost... I don't want to say dubstep because I don't like dubstep, but it does sound kind of like that. And there are scenes like when she's getting like the booby traps ready. It's music kind of like that. And then at the end credits, I think it fits perfectly. And I think it's well done. I, I actually really enjoyed it. Nima Fakhara is, is <coughs> uh, the person that did the music. Um... Don't know anything else. This person has done several episodes of Cold Case. But shows in film, I'm not really... Not really uh, familiar with anything. But, you know, it... It is... It does have a lot in common with a lot of other home invasion movies that came before it. But, you know, it does sort of add the Home Alone aspect. You know, the kid being a... Well, she's playing a 13-year-old, but having to fight back. Like, the idea of just how... It's not this all-American family. It has its issues. So it, may, it might not feel like the stakes are as high if it's like a Hills Have Eyes kind of family. You know, straight with the father, the mother's dead, there's this new girlfriend, which she's also mad that her dad is now engaged like a year later. <clears throat> and yeah, it is kind of familiar neo-Nazi kind of... It's not like they go super in deep with it. I mean, there are a couple times where they do like the for the Brotherhood kind of salute. But there were some lines and some things that did kind of help separate it. Some choices that do help separate it from other movies like Your Next or other home invasion movies. And I was surprised by Kevin J's performance. I, I hope he does do more movies like this. Not necessarily home invasion, but definitely thriller. It was... I guess it is to a, a big extent formulaic, but there is plenty 
enough for it to stand on its own. And I really did enjoy it. It was never boring. Uh, very fast paced. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I definitely think this girl, uh, Lulu Wilson, definitely has a future ahead of her. She's already got two other horror films uh, that she's done when she was younger. Kevin James, this could be a huge door opener for him. So, yeah. I'm just going to start repeating myself. But the last thing I'll say, aside from I really did enjoy this movie, is as formulaic as it is, even in some of its more original parts, it it's still plenty enough that, you know, you'll be able to remember Becky. Like, it, it does work well enough to stand on its own, as formulaic as it may be, but... I really enjoyed it. I'm glad I finally saw it. It seems like a lot of people on YouTube enjoyed it. So if you haven't seen it but stuck through all the spoilers, which that's the thing with movies that start at the end, jump backwards and work up, they kind of spoil a lot of it themselves. But I really enjoyed Becky. I had fun with it. And uh, thank you for watching. Oh,